my, my title is indeed thinking inside the box. I think this box bashing is terrible these days. You always have to think outside the box. So today we are thinking inside the box. Um, uh, this presentation is uh, based on a draft article uh, I'm, I'm working on and of course I cannot uh, include all, all the things which are in the paper to this talk, So, uh, but we can go uh, to these things also in the Q&A if, if necessary. Before I start my actual talk, I think I will be talking about 45-ish minutes. Um, uh, I will just briefly introduce the structure uh, of the talk. So uh, first I'm going to talk about the infamous black box problem. Uh, what is a black box and why is the problem? After that I will go to uh, the, the main contribution I, I'd say of this talk and with my transparency uh, ideals. Uh, I, will, I will argue that transparency has a hidden function in logic and this complicates the whole idea of whether or not transparency can deliver its it's promised to, to, to solve the black box problem. Uh, then I will bring these two together. I discuss a little bit how, uh, with the aid of my, my transparency ideas, uh, what, what will uh, happen in the black box context in, in automated decision making, or I, I call it ADM, uh, it's an abbreviation. And in the end, I have uh, a little bit of speculation of the future of this ideal. So there are a lot of questions, uh, a lot of open-ended uh, uh, ideas. I don't know uh, where, where, to, to where transparency will be going, but I have, of course, some questions and I, I hope we can discuss them together. So um, let me... Uh, start by, by telling you a story, a story from Finland where I come from. And this uh, story is about a man uh, who wanted to build a house. And to that end he brought some materials online. That's, that's quite common practice these days. And he was living in, in, in rural Finland and his mother tongue was Finnish as there is a vast majority of Finns, like 95%. There are Swedish speakers but they are like five, six percent of the population. So most of us are speaking Finnish. So he could not pay all his materials immediately, so he applied for a partial payment option uh, from a financing institution which was cooperating with this, uh, uh, this uh, building materials company. And he was a good citizen. He had no prior record to, of disruptions of payment any problems or in any problems with his uh, credit history. However, his application was denied. So the computer said no. And this denial was done by using statistical methods uh, in automated decision making. So according to the statistics of the firm, Swedish speakers and women were more likely to pay back their loans than Finnish speakers and men. Mm -hmm. uh, this probability was embedded into data which was used to train the algorithm. Um, thus, the algorithm was found favoring Swedish, speaker, Swedish speakers and women over Finnish speakers and men. So, in other words, the applicant was denied a financing option because of his gender, his age, place of residence, uh, and his mother tongue and their cumulative effect. The rejection of the applicant was uh, thus caused by profiling, and uh, not an individual assessment of credit worthiness. The case uh, was considered both by the anti-discrimination ombudsman and due to her initiative, uh, the National Non-Discrimination and Equality Tribunal in Finland. The tribunal found the firm guilty of multi-reason discrimination. It was given a fine and order to discontinue this discriminatory practice. Let me tell you another story, and another story comes from, from Poland. The Polish Ministry of Labor and Social Policy introduced a new system of granting unemployment benefits in 2014. And it was based on a survey and an interview, which uh, uh, functioned an, as an input of a score. The unemployed needed to fill in a form of set of questions 
indicating, for example, the reason of unemployment. Although there was blank space uh, left for answering seemingly open-ended questions, um, in reality, there were 22 predefined answers. The questionnaire did not recognize certain reasons such as homelessness or ethnic origin or being a convicted uh, felon as a valid reason, uh, although they in practice uh, made a major uh, employability impediments in the Polish uh, labor market. So uh, according to the acquired score, the applicants were sorted into three different categories. The first category of people was considered the most employable, having high education and, um, and the unemployment stemming from uh, some haphazard personal or market reason. They were only 2% of the applicants. The second category of applicants was somewhat worse off, although still having some important skills. And these were 65% of the applicants. They were considered potentially in need of some additional education skills and support. The last category was the most problematic. It consisted, it consisted of people to whom most of life's adversities uh, seem to accumulate. So illness, drug abuse, lack of education, marginalization. And this third category of people was 33% of the applicants. So each of these categories um, were entitled to a different menu of benefits according to their needs. However, also in this case, there were hidden problems. Namely, there was virtually no possibility of contesting one's categorization. No information was available on the scoring rules. In addition, the array of different um, benefits and other supporting services were unevenly distributed so that they were least available to the third category of people who uh, obviously needed them the most. Um, in other words, the system was largely considered discriminatory, lacking transparency and infringing uh, data protection uh, rights. So the system of organizing unemployment governance caused resistance uh, most prominently by a civil society organization. In the end, Poland's constitutional court found the system breaching the constitution, although mostly due to reasons of legislative form. And, this was and it was abolished last year, to my knowledge at least. Um, so what we can learn from these stories? At least, uh, at least two things, I'd say. First, they represent the larger development uh, of the emergence of the scored society. The society uh, in which there is a new way of quantifying ra and ranking people. They are made of stereotypes and profiles of individuals based on certain characteristics, such as wealth, gender, habits, education, and so on. This leads to simplification and, and generalization to the treatment of people as representatives of, of certain categories rather than unique individuals. Some of these profiles have, have proven discriminatory as illustrated. Second, there is lack of information of the scoring rules. How were these categorizations made? What was the algorithm like? Why did the computer say no? Due to the lack of information, there were only limited possibilities to react to the breach of individual rights. It can even be unclear whether uh, any rights indeed had been violated at all. So in the bigger picture, the problem is this. When it comes to ADM, we cannot really be sure how the inputs translate into outputs and who is to blame if something goes wrong. And this difficulty is often referred to as the black box problem. Because ADM is considered handy in many ways, it has the potential to be objective, it has the potential to save a lot of money. Uh, solutions to tackle this problem are actively sought. And although the black box need not to be a problem per se, the problem language 
uh, is present in the context of ADM in a very good reasons. So um, biases and other harms uh, do happen unexplained. So why is that? Uh, there can be at least two, two reasons for this. So first, the code on which the ADM system is based can be poorly designed. That is to say, the coders may deliberately or unbeknownst to themselves favor choices that advantage certain people over other, others. Like human judges or administrators, they are also affected by their humanity, uh, their attitudes, preferences, their bodily sensations. They can be hungry, they can be tired, uh, not, to not to mention certain background variables. Uh, such as gender, uh, age, religion, ethnicity, culture, and so on. And these things uh, may further affect the code, uh, resulting in outputs which may be biased or otherwise unanticipated. Second, in particular when it comes to machine learning and uh, de deep learning neural networks and big data, this bias may shift its shape. The human bias may fossilize in the very data. And as learning algorithms uh, need large amounts of data to recognize patterns in it, these patterns may prove discriminatory, crucially because we humans are at the source of those data. It reflects who we are and how we tend to behave, and not how we should behave and how we would like to be. It thus derives ought from this. When those outputs based on the skewed inputs uh, are used as a basis for future predictions, they may actually reproduce the bias in it and thus create self-fulfilling prophecies. So this is the garbage in, garbage out phenomenon. So even if we would have a neutral process, we don't necessarily have a neutral outcome. However, with varying success, we can see that there are visible, uh, there are some um, remedies available. It is debatable, though, whether they are, are um, well suited to the legal problems uh, of the scored society. Um, these questions have gained much attention over the last couple of years. Um, I'd say from 16, 17 onwards, this discourse has really grown. For example, to tackle the black box problem and other challenges of the ADM, the amount of different codes of conduct uh, or AI ethics codes have skyrocketed over the last couple of years. Um, as the independent NGO algorithms watch shows the number is actually staggering. These codes of conduct are of various kinds and given by different uh, institutions. Uh, some of them are, are private uh, some are public and some are given by different kinds of hybrid partnerships. And what unites uh, a great majority of these codes uh, uh, is the call for transparency. It is one of the, uh, it's also one of the main principles of the EU's uh, general data protection regulation, uh, which governs the data processing and data protection rights in the EU. And this resorting to transparency is hardly surprising uh, as the promise of it's overwhelmingly positive. Nonetheless, as promising as it sounds, I argue that transparency cannot really deliver in resolving the black box problem in ADM. Why? I will, I will explain. Um, like any vague concept, transparency can be approached a plethora of ways. And depending on the context, transparency can mean different things, also in uh, uh, ADM. And now it can be associated to source code, publicity, auditing, impact assessment, and things like that. However, I'm not interested that much on these uh, things, but uh, more the theoretical questions. Um, as a normative metaphor, its basic idea is simple. It promises legitimacy uh, by making an object or behavior visible and as such controllable. Similarly, algorithmic transparency follows a simple logic. 
if we only could open the black, uh, up the, uh, the algorithmic black boxes and see their inner workings, uh, we could make sure that they are fair. So if there is something to be fixed with the aid of transparency, we could uh, fix them. Nevertheless, the, the promise of transparency is uh, more complex than the promise suggests. It has a hidden functioning logic. And in the following, I will approach this logic from three different angles. Uh, transparency as a, as a visual metaphor. Uh, transparency is an, something I call iconoambivalence. Uh, and third, the latent conjunction between transparency and intentionality. And this always will lead to an overall, overall idea, uh, which I call the human face logic of transparency. And this logic has quite dramatic consequences uh, concerning the general promise vested in transparency and consequently the specific promise, promise it has in ADM. So first let's start with the, the uh, metaphor. We can notice uh, that as a concept, transparency appeals specifically to our vision, our ability to see things with our own eyes. We cannot hear transparency, although there's a lot of transparency talk, so maybe that's not quite true. Um, uh, nor smell it or taste it. It's a visual promise. Therefore, uh, it, could, uh, it could be called a visual or ocular-centric arrangement. So perhaps we can better grasp this idea when we think about looking to a window. Something is made directly and intentionally visible to the viewer, which otherwise would stay hidden. Without transparency, we cannot see, but with, tra with transparency, we can. So I argue this literal meaning of transparency enables its metaphorical or analogical use. Um, the visual undertow of transparency makes it understandable and attractive to us in cases when we are talking about abstractions such as governance. So long as we can witness the reality with our own eyes, we don't need any verbal explanations, which are, by virtue of transparency, indirectly considered less reliable uh, than direct visual observation. So there is a promise of access to unmediated uh, truth. Uh, so this is the very core, I argue, why it's so appealing to us. So seeing by oneself uh, seems, to, um, seems to be a privileged way of knowing. Seeing is understanding, or understanding is seeing. So there is this kind of idea of first-hand knowledge which we can uh, acquire through transparency practices and which is kind of better than, than second-hand knowledge, which are explanations, uh, more second-hand uh, knowledge. Okay, so this brings us to the second and not obvious aspect of transparency, which I call iconoambivalence. And I apologize for this terrible neologism. This is my own, <laughs> own concoction, but I think it kind of captures uh, what, uh, what I mean, what I want to say. So what does, it's a very simple idea, actually. Uh, it refers to peculiarity of transparency as a governance ideal. On the one hand, transparency is ideologically iconoclastic, so it means hostile towards images. Uh, what I mean by this, that is suspicious towards images, explanations, mediation. Um, it attempts to strip governance from all kind of obfuscating veils, secrecy, appearances, concealment. It promises to allow governance to emerge in its pure essence before the eyes of the viewer. So this transcendence, if you will, of governance would take care of its own representation uh, so long as the impediments blocking its visibility uh, were removed before the eyes of the viewer. On the other hand, uh, I argue, uh, transparency is also iconophilic and necessarily so. so uh, friendly towards images and, and uh, representation, visual representation. So if, if iconoclasm is the ideological aspect of transparency, iconophily is this unescapable practicality. In many cases, there is nothing to show, nothing to emerge, 
without conscious efforts and constructs. Therefore, transparency needs to rely on images metonymically understood. Illustrations, statistics, performances, reports, so conscious constructed appearances mostly falling into the category of documents. How indeed could transparency reveal the truth about something as abstract as person's, person's credit worthiness uh, without any construct which was depicted? So in this sense, uh, transparency needs to rely on people and their mimetic abilities. So their ability to, to document what is happening. Um, uh, their capabilities to capture, if you will, the essence of governance and to communicate it to, to public. This iconophilic aspect of transparency thus refers to the accessibility of those created illustrations uh, of intangible abstractions. For example, the score of one's employability is an iconophilic expression of a social construct which does not exist naturally in the world. The iconoambivalence of transparency leads to a paradox. So transparency uh, means, in Emmanuel Aloha's word, mediated immediacy. It uh, both is and it needs to be created. And I like this picture actually kind of captures it. This this text, uh, somebody, somebody has written transparency, so it's kind of created. At the same time, it's written on transparency itself. So it's something which is visual uh, and, it's, and it's some, uh, at the same time it's verbal. It's created and it's something which naturally kind of emerges. So, however, the complexity does not even end here. Uh, uh, as mentioned, transparency is associated with legitimacy. It's generally considered something desirable. Transparency is good, whereas uh, the lack of transparency is bad. How does this legitimating effect work? To answer that, we need to address the, the mentioned third aspect of the hidden functional logic of transparency, namely that of intentionality. Um, it is important to notice that transparency is not only a virtue or a good thing, but it, under certain circumstances it is a sign of failure. And this contention has its roots in linguistic observation available for anyone to test. Uh, if I say one of you, uh, you are so transparent, I can see through you. So you're probably not thinking, oh, that's great, finally. <laughs> It's probably like, oh, oh no, oh no, uh, there is something wrong here. Uh, and this actually, I think, is uh, quite um, a re revealing thing about transparency. So we might say you are so transparent when, when we notice that someone uh, is someone's failure to come across in a certain predetermined uh, way. In that case, the attempt is implausible to the extent that we cannot but see the truer truth behind the facade, or at least we think we do. And perhaps counterintuitively, we resent this revelation. We don't like this. Uh, we prefer hidden motives hidden and value transparency only when it's declared as such, when it's intentional. So when we say that, okay, I, I want to be transparent to you and therefore I will reveal you this and this thing, I want to be honest, then oh wow, She's being honest, she's being transparent, that's, that's great. But if you see that without me declaring it, then it's something I'd probably be very embarrassed. I couldn't, couldn't keep my, my face, my appearance intact. I would, my, my facade would be leaking information I would not like to happen. Um, So hence, transparency is regarded as a value when it's consciously created or allowed, but frowned upon uh, when it's a sign of involuntary revelation, signifying the, the incapability to keep hidden things hidden. This intentionality is the key to the mentioned uh, human uh, face nature of the ideal of transparency. And this dynamic uh, of transparency has largely remained unexplored in academic literature. 
Uh, however, it has huge implications when we think about the promise and beliefs vested in transparency. And of course, I'm trying to fill this academic gap very uh, 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 many ways. So, um, oh, let me see. Uh, so, this to say, transparency, both referring to social life and, and as a governance ideal, is closely linked to things like prestige, appearance, reputation, favorable impressions, and in the case of failure, loss of strategy or the emergence of shame. And in voluntary transparency, makes one appear in an unplanned way. Um, so, it is about mediating on what can be, can be seen. In other words, it's about managing visibilities. The key word that captures this dynamic is uh, impression management. And it's a term coined by social psychologist Erwin Goffman in late 1950s. Uh, in, in his book, Presentation of Self in Everyday Life. And in it, he explains how social life is and cannot but be performative in nature. We carefully plan how we want to appear to others and what part of our lives we want to keep to ourselves in turn. And this enables us to have a, a face, a social persona. And I argue uh, that the similar mechanism is characteristic of institutions, governments, organizations, tech companies. Uh, they too have an interest to uphold a certain image, a certain face, a certain persona. They want to control what information they release. If that was not the case, uh, information leaks, for example, could not create such scandals that they often do. As a result, it's possible to hypothesize that the use of different transparency practices, whether physical or metaphorical, uh, iconoclastic, iconophilic, uh, are motivated by this very goal to appear in favorable light. So if we take this, uh, this idea to the extreme, we arrive to a rather radical conclusion. And um, this would be what I call the truth legitimacy trade-off. This picture is from the emperor's new clothes where the emperor uh, was found uh, that he was actually naked and he tried, this, tried to, to uphold his social uh, persona, his face, so what I mean by, by truth legitimacy trade-off is that um, by intentional transparency, more legitimacy uh, can be achieved, but most probably it is based on carefully curated picture of reality. If, on the other hand, there is no such curation, there will be more extensive access to information, but most probably less legitimacy because also the less flattering elements of reality uh, would be subject to external gaze. And this is premised on the idea that only intentional transparency is capable of, uh, of creating legitimacy. So the image created by transparency is designed to be seen in this managed visibility. Um, here is not, we cannot really uh, delve into this human face logic of transparency more deeply. Uh, that said, the most important implication of the logic uh, needs to be highlighted. Uh, so, transparency is an ideal, it's not neutral. It's not neutral visibility of undistorted flow of information. When something is framed as transparency, it is also planned to deliver a particular kind of message to enable its deliverer to uphold a persona, a face. And this message may be constructed or, or it may, um, or allowed to emerge um, depending on the context. In any case, the release is controlled. In other words, we, don't, we do not only see through transparency, we also see the transparency itself. So that makes the medium the, the message, as uh, Marshall McLuhan has uh, famously put it. Okay, let's move to, back to the ADM context uh, from this uh, theoretical uh, ideas. 
So I'm now presenting some of my, uh, the key factors of my general transparency theory, if you will. Um, uh, or is it a socio, uh, socio legal or, or <coughs> governance ideal? However, this, these factors functions function as a tool for analysis in assessing the potential of transparency to solve the black box problem in ADM. So what happens to the human face logic of transparency if, at least seemingly, humans no longer are always the gatekeepers of information and the managers of impression? Is there anyone to conceal or reveal? Alternatively, does Human mediation govern transparency also in EDM? And if so, what follows from that? So in ADM, the human agent caring for appearance to others may be distant, if not in some cases completely absent. Uh, regardless, the main uh, feature of plan visibilities uh, remains. If a scoring algorithm, for example, for creditworthiness, software was deliberately revealed in the name of transparency, that could increase the legitimacy of the releasing institution, right? Oh, they're transparent, that's great, that's very bold, uh, that's honest. But if it were leaked instead, we would be equally informed, uh, but most likely less impressed. Uh, however, in ADM, the particular object of transparency, the algorithm or the scoring rules, uh, complicates the issue. It is possible to argue that in the context of ADM, the standard narrative of transparency is not uh, necessarily entirely valid. So the let's look inside of the black box uh, may be too limited of uh, demand. So the metaphor may be unsuitable when we are talking about something as complex as algorithmic systems. It just uh, suggests falsely easy certainty which would follow from looking. So do we really understand um, uh, if we see an algorithm? Probably not. Hence the promise of seeing is understanding, the promise of first hand knowledge may fail in the call for transparency. Its object is hard to decipher and indeed to be held uh, accountable. So this problem of transparency has started to surface actually in the current legal and ethical discourses of transparency and AI ethics. For example, in the uh, GDPR, the information that data controller is obliged to provide to the data subject on the ADM needs to be meaningful and transparent. Thus, uh, transparency does not only define the availability of information, but also the quality of it. Additionally, in many AI ethics codes, other similar conceptualizations have lately emerged into the discourse. Explainability, interpretability, intelligibility, explicability, understandability, comprehensibility. Those concepts indirectly manifest uh, the problem of transparency to be an easy overall solution. Because seeing no longer guarantees understanding, it has become an issue of its own right. Thus, uh, we need to consider the question of iconophily and the necessary human involvement in it, in it uh, entails. Uh, we can also assume that ADM is not naturally attuned uh, to consider meaningfulness of information from human understanding point of view. This human intervention may shift toward uh, transparency towards understandability. This may be problematic because ideologically transparency specifically privileges immediate uh, seeing over uh, over mediated verbal explanations. If transparency becomes a synonym of explanation, it inevitably loses something from its legitimating power. The core promise of do not believe uh, what I say, see by yourself, would thus be trans transformed into its antonym, antonym. Do not believe what you see, let me explain instead. 
However, uh, as I kind of feel it, transparency, uh, uh, transparency requiring constructs in order to create visible appearance together with the intentionality of transparency enables considering human understanding and its limitations. So it can also do some good work. On the one hand, it may produce information which is meaningful from the average data subject's point of view and create legitimacy like that. On the other hand, however, it is potentially also a form of impression management logic. The more human mediation there is, resulting in carefully managed visibilities, the more legitimacy may be produced. At the same time, this may also mean less truth when the intricacy of the black box cannot, by being exposed, necessarily communicate anything. So this was the truth legitimacy trade-off. So it is important to notice that human mediation is needed in the process of translating the inner workings of the black box into the layman human understandable form. How much is lost in translation and how much should one anticipate uh, those potential explanations to serve the interest of the data controller? Maybe black boxes even represent, in Elena Esposito's words, divinatory rationality. So in pre-modern times, uh, the, the mystery of the oracle was the guarantee of rationality uh, of the procedure. So it was convincing and reliable precisely because human lacks the ability to understand and the logic of the world, not despite of that. As argued, um, transparency seems to be uh, uh, seen increasingly insufficient in addressing the core issues of the black box problem. Regardless, the term transparency still seems to carry justificatory promise that the other terms do not. This is visible in the vocabulary of the, uh, vocabulary of the GDPR. In it, transparency is specifically one of the key principles which trickles down to more concrete information uh, release practices. So its history is longer than the other similar concepts and is closely linked to democracy and citizen participation. So transparency has the potential to empower to action. After all, it's a mechanism of control because it assumes that everyone has the potential to understand by seeing and then taking necessary action. The immediate visibility inherent in transparency emancip uh, has emancipatory potential different from the mentioned neighboring concepts. Explanation includes more human influence than sheer transparency, however illusory. Thus, the rise of understandability as a legal uh, leading principle has the potential to make people passive recipients of simplified information in, and being increasingly dependent on translating uh, intermediaries. Okay, last point, uh, the future of transparency. This sounds very uh, festive. Um, so, in the end, the entire binary distinction between humans and machines may prove problematic, as uh, science and technology studies uh, suggest. To the extent that transparency is seen as human-faced, it presupposes people who are concerned about their impression. If transparency is seen as a tool of representation, whether in terms of sincere mimicking, impression management, or full-fledged distortion, it still relies on the idea of, of reality principle. There is a ground truth that which can be uh, presented. And that truth can be delivered and understood. What would it imply from the perspective of transparency's legitimating promise if humans were removed from the equation? Are we left with governance which no longer needs humans as its agents? Would such governance promise acceptability precisely because of the lack of ever so dubious and self-interested people. Um, these questions are tricky for several reasons. Namely, the basic functioning logic of transparency may change if governance will start uh, running through algorithmic modeling and deep machine learning. It may well be soon that algorithms, once created by humans, uh, 
uh, with human desires um, lose their monopoly to control them. Algorithms may be uh, independent to the extent that they themselves create new algorithms, even audit other algorithms. Sometimes I even mentioned Franken algorithms, uh, algorithms which are like monsters. Um, there is no uh, reason to assume that algorithms in ADM would necessarily think like humans. It would be hard to imagine that algorithms would desire other algorithms' approval, would want to be in contact with, uh, uh, with them and belong to the community of algorithms. There is neither a reason to assume that they would want to be seen in favorable light uh, uh, by other algorithms, uh, to have high status on algorithmic community, to avoid being shamed in front of other algorithms. So just by this little thought experiment, our own humanity, having core of a social animal, uh, becomes sufficiently clear. It's easy to see how transparency practices work to our human way of thinking and, uh, and, and acting. So to sum up, um, my main claim is that unlike the mainstream narratives suggest, uh, transparency is not neutral. To create legitimacy, it needs to be performative. This performativity, together with the icono-ambivalent logic, goes counter the promise of unmediated visibility invested in, in, in transparency. Um, subsequently, in order to ensure the legitimacy of ADM, if we are after this legitimacy, we need to be mindful of this hidden functioning logic. Um, so as I argued, transparency is brought to the context of algorithms and ADM, its peculiarities uh, are becoming visible in a new uh, 